You have attracted some incredible talent to co-create courses with you. Michael Beckwith, Marianne Williamson, Deepak Chopra. The Oprah Winfrey Network building was about three or four blocks away. I was like, how do we get them involved? She was in the very early days with Deepak. We registered about 120,000 people in the first five days, and it was an amazing success. From the perspective of the creator, what have you noticed about how people take courses? What are some of the things that helps increase that average of people who make it to the end of the course? How do you make sure within the course creation that people are actually going to do this stuff? What you measure, you can improve. So when people witness metrics of transformation in their own journey, they ascribe more value to the experience. I was looking up, um, you were on the show originally, you were on episode 10, and we are now approaching episode 200, uh, 200 yeah. weekly episodes, so we're going on four years now. And so back in episode 10, if you guys want to go back and listen to that episode, we talk a lot about Jeff's superhero origin story mm -hmm. and and the the rocky path towards starting Wanderlust. And then we kind of left off, we, we ended the episode with you forming a commune. And so I kind of wanted to pick up at that, at that junction point where you, you moved on from Wanderlust and you had this other idea, or maybe you had the idea first and then you moved on from Wanderlust. So let's start with just that. Let's start with talking about that transition point. How did you know, and this was pre-pandemic, so how did you know that it was time to make a change? Because, you know, I think a lot of people would have considered you, Jeff Krasno is living his dream. He's got this thing that he personally created and he's seen it evolve. It was on paper, you know, from, from our vantage point, successful. Lots of great participation. I personally participated in, in dozens of wanderlusts, but you had some internal, internal cues, I imagine. So what were those internal cues? What was the internal conversation around that in case anybody else out there who looks like they're living the dream on paper is also feeling the same, same way. Like there's some shift that's happening. How do you know when to take that shift? Well, you can't judge a book by its cover. Can you like, um, uh, appearances can be deceiving, I guess I would say, is that, yeah, Wanderlust was, ah, oh, man, just a, a tremendous undertaking for me uh, personally. I mean, I, I assisted in delivering X chromosomes, three of them during that period. So I had three daughters during the time of Wanderlust at its peak in 2016, uh, were a, a time when you were very involved. Uh, I believe we had 68 events in 20 countries, so um, I couldn't even go to all of them, obviously. But my children essentially grew up in the Wanderlust environment, and uh, and that is the source of a tremendous amount of gratification and the community that we were able to foster there. But even though from the outside, <laughs> this was an adventure in health and wellness for everybody else, um, I would categorize it as a foray into what became sort of wealth and hellness for me. <laughs> uh, um, and, uh, I guess I would just say by the time 2017, 2018 rolled around and I'd been doing it for 10 years, you know, my personal health had severely degraded. I was traveling nonstop. Uh, I was suffering from wicked, wicked insomnia, uh, and then all of the knock-on impacts that came with, with that, um, you know, chronic fatigue, uh, you know, irritability, the inability to focus and concentrate. I gained quite a bit of weight. I was kind of tipping at like one, at like 210, um, and, uh. And just the quality of my life had, you know, really degraded. Um, you know, I, I kind of considered myself <laughs> the insoluble uh, fiber for Wanderlust. I, I kept the company regular, <laughs> but eventually it had expelled me out of the anus 
Um, and, uh, and I really had to take a pretty, um, significant inventory of my health. And, you know, I finally put on this little device that I wear on my triceps now called a continuous glucose monitor. And I stared into the app, um, and I was, you know, had fasting blood glucose levels of like 125 milligrams per deciliter, which is essentially diabetic. I went to my primary care physician. I'd probably canceled probably five or six of my annual visits in a row. And, uh, and sure enough, I did my hemoglobin A1C and it was like six and a half percent. It's kind of diabetic levels, kind of pre borderline pre-diabetic, diabetic levels. And, um, I had to wake up to the reality that I was living in the nightmare that is, uh, you know, modern American society, you know, like 60% of everybody else in this country. Um, I know you're not in this country right now, but you know, this is a phenomenon, not just confined to the United States, but you know, I had metabolic dysfunction, like 90% of other people here, uh, I was diabetic, pre-diabetic, you know, like 50% of the other people in the United States and, you know, like 60% of the other people in the United States had a chronic disease. So, uh, I had to, uh, all of a sudden, you know, really pay very, very close attention and align what I was doing in my life with, you know, the principles. And, um, and so commune in many respects was, a was a tool for me to amplify, you know, the, the, the teachings and lessons of, of great thought leaders and integrative and functional medicine doctors and yogis and meditation and spiritual leaders. But it was honestly also a end of one experiment for myself. Like I jumped into the Petri dish of my own life. I interviewed 500 doctors and mystics and sages over the last five years. And began to finally apply the wisdom that I had been able to glean to myself, um, and, and have been lucky enough to, to have a significant transformation or be in, in the process of a transformation. Mm. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. When Elon and company sold PayPal, you know, for hundreds of millions of dollars that he personally got, he immediately re-upped into some other projects. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I'm not sure how fiscally um, uh, rewarding mm -hmm. your wanderlust exit was, but was that something that you also knew that you were going to do? Were you, were you actively looking for another project? Um, and, and what was the genesis of, of one commune? Cause you guys were doing online yeah. courses and stuff with Wanderlust. You'd started doing that. So I'm just curious, like, what was that inflection point? Yeah. So I was really keen at Wanderlust to, um, create an online course business as part of it, because, you know, as you know, you know, Wanderlust was this incredible celebration of community at, at these peak moments but then you know sunday night everybody went home and um and i felt that the digital content while sometimes not as like fully transformational as the in real life immersion that you get from an, an event um was also really useful because it provided a form of glue you know um, between maybe one peak experience and the next, it was a way to bring your practice back into the quotidian. Um, so I had experimented, you know, with a number, obviously, you know, we did a 21 day meditation challenge together. I think it, it really started with my wife, Skylar, um, you know, she was a yoga teacher and, uh, um, I had developed this relationship with Oprah and the Oprah Winfrey network. Um, and, uh, we, I basically started literally like at the mail room, man. I was like, we opened Wanderlust Hollywood and the Oprah Winfrey network, the own building was about three or four blocks away. And I was like, God, Oprah, she's right here. I mean, I can basically on a good day, hit a tennis ball to her, you know, to her office. 
Uh, like, how do we get, how do we get them involved? I was like, so we printed up some passes and we said like, okay, we're going to bring them over to the Oprah Winfrey Network. We're going to give the staff passes just to like get on their radar. Right. And, um, it literally started like that at that level. And of course we walked over there and we're like, oh yeah, yeah. And then the security was like, what do you guys get the hell out of here? You know, like, but eventually we sort of, uh, penetrated, you know, the Death Star and we got in and, you know, we found the human resources person and we're like, Hey, you know, here's some passes. And that just slowly bubbled up to different people. And, you know, pretty soon like Sherry Salata, who was the president of, of own and I connected we did some workshops together. They were like bringing some of their people over to Wanderlust Hollywood to practice and to have lunch on the patio, et cetera. Uh, and then, you know, Sherry was, was, you know, we developed a relationship. This is a long answer, but, um, but she was kind enough to put me on this list, you know, which was the super soul 100 list. Um, and tell you got on that list just from, from taking tickets to. I get it. I mean, that's, I mean, that's how you got on their radar, I should say. Yeah. That's how I got on their radar. I was like the, I, I, cause dude, I was old school. I was music business style. Like I was the dude on the corner being like, come to the show, you know, handing out handbills, you know? Um, and, uh, and so Sherry and I developed a relationship. She saw what we had done at Wanderlust. She was like, wow, this guy's a real deal. You know, she put me on this super soul 100 list. I just started to get invited to stuff because I'm on that list. I consider myself number 99 on that list. You know, this was the top 100 entrepreneurs in the United States. The other people on that list, like, are like insane. You know, we would, I would go to these events and there, there's George Lucas and Ariana Huffington and Julia Roberts and Lynn manuel Miranda. I mean, you know, it was insane. But because I was on this email, like, I was in. And so we did one event at the lot, uh, at her lot. Um, and, uh, there was a brunch and I'm sitting there with Gabby Bernstein, uh, Marie Forleo and, um, uh, uh, I don't know, one, one other woman, you know, that, that like Danielle Laporte. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, we're sitting at the table and there's one empty seat at the table. And, um, I see Sherry kind of scurry by. I'm like, Hey Sherry, you know, come sit with us, you know? She's like, no, no, that, that seat saved, whatever. I'm like, all right, but you know, come on. She's like five minutes later, she seats Oprah right there. Mm -hmm. And like right across from me, you know, and man, like I've been fortunate enough to like meet plenty of famous people, you know, over the course of my life, you know, yeah. whatever. That's not a brag. It's just like you live in New York and LA long enough. You do enough things. You're out there in the mix. You just meet people. But I was nervous, man. I was nervous. Um, you feel like you have to have something important to say when Oprah's sitting across the table. From your well, funny that you should say that because I had something saved up that I said, if I ever meet Oprah, I've got something up my sleeve. So she sat there and she was like heavy on the Weight Watchers tip at that juncture. So she was funny. And she was like pointing at things on the plate, like two points, one point, three points. I don't know for Weight Watchers, but that's, you know, she was assigning points to all the food on the table. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of fun. It was lighthearted. And um, so finally I, I got the gumption up and I said, you know, hey, Oprah, you know, I did all those meditation challenges with Deepak, you know, and uh, I think you should have married Deepak. She's like, looked at me like with just like a really cross face. She's like, what, what are you talking about? What? And I said, because then you could have been Oprah Chopra. <laughs> and I can't believe that she'd never heard that before. I mean, she must have thought about it at some point, but that was enough to break the ice. And I, I was like, you know, you've done all these meditation challenges. Why don't we do a yoga challenge? What do you think about that? And I was like pitching her, you know, I'm, can you imagine how many times she gets pitched? <laughs> but there we were. And she's like, that. she's like, young man, this body does not do yoga. You know, she's like, no, 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 no. I'm like, oh, I'm not talking about some lycra clad, like 
blonde, ponytailed, whimsical things get pushing up into a handstand. Like I'm talking about like yoga, like really elementary yoga. It's for everyone. We should, we need to make the biggest possible tent for this practice. And, you know, you have such a incredible reach. You know, I think you, we could really work together. And she heard it. And that next week I got an email and they said, yeah, we heard this thing from Oprah. You want to do this yoga challenge? Will you come over and tell us what it's all about? And there I was in the boardroom with all the decision makers. And I was very well prepared. And I was like, listen, it was this 21 day uh, yoga challenge and it's all online. We're going to make it free. We're going to make it accessible to as many people as we possibly can. We're going to democratize the practice, bring it to the people that need it the most. And they were in, you know, and then they called me <laughs> a couple of days later. They're like, we like it. You know, we're in, but you're the yoga guy. You're going to host it on your platform and we'll market it. We'll market it hard. I'm like, I'm in. Oh my God. Let's go, 100%. I hung up the phone. I'm like, I don't have a platform. <laughs> but like, what are you going to say at that juncture? So we had to build a platform. Um, and that eventually became Commune, essentially. And, um, or the idea, you know, and, and they were very generous. They basically spoon-fed me this model of, of, you know, making a certain amount of content for free and available and then eventually locking it up and, and, and selling it to people that, that could afford it. And we were, uh, you know, we registered about 120,000 people in that program in the first five days and we launched it and it was an amazing success. And, you know, uh, the community, the online community that it built and the short and the stories that were told, uh, kind of between people going through that course were just unbelievably moving and powerful. And that was kind of the genesis of then what eventually became Commune and, and what informed the business model. Wow, that's a great story. I didn't know Oprah was involved in the inception of, of this platform. Uh, so a couple questions, just going back to fill in some of the gaps. Was your initial idea for Oprah to be the one that's like sort of guiding the med <laughs> yoga or how did that work? Yeah. No, it, it was always Skylar was going to teach it, at least in my mind's eye. Uh -huh. Obviously, you know, Oprah and, and Deepak had collaborated on those meditation challenges where she would often do kind of the forward, mm -hmm. the, but it was all audio. So she'd get on the mic and she said, you know, this is Oprah Winfrey. You know, I learned about meditation through my friend Deepak Chopra. And I've made it a regular part of my life. And it's, you know, bent the arc of my life in this way. And here's Deepak, you know, so I was hoping that maybe she, you know, would preface the program in, in some fashion, uh, but she didn't, but that's okay. You know, she gave it kind of her stamp of, of, of approval and, um, and marketed it, you know, with vigor and, uh, it was a big part of the success. When it came to. You said you had 120,000 people who were in the first, who, who enrolled in the first five days. Was that a result of her marketing as well? Or was that just straight through the Wanderlust list? Yeah, no, no, that was really a lot of her marketing, uh, okay. because they had such a big list, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and such tremendous reach and, you know, she was tweeting about it and, you know. Yeah. And they'd already um, done several rounds of the Deepak. Oprah. Oh, yeah. And Lynch. So did you model yours after, after that? For hundreds of went? 100%. Basically I went over there. I spent a lot of time over at those on, at the own offices. Um, they had, you know, they, they, they had a TV network, so they were doing scripted and, you know, Tyler Perry got involved, et cetera. They were doing all that stuff, but they had a small component of, um, the business that was really focused on, on this kind of, um, you know, learning and spiritual platform, et cetera. And, and, you know, they had done courses with like Brene Brown and with right. Brendan Burchard and some other folks. And so they had really perfected this model and I went over there and they were just, they basically just spoon fed me the model. They're like, here's how we do it. And, you know, here's the best practices. Now off you go and, you know, do the best job you can, young man. <laughs> and so I did. Would you mind, would you mind just giving us just a broad stroke? 
sort of overview of what some of those best practices were that that were that were insightful for you that you didn't know or you wouldn't have guessed mm-hmm. um, yeah in- well i mean a, a lot of these are relatively tried and true and, and fairly well known at this juncture but when we first started um you know they weren't as omnipresent Um, like I think COVID really accelerated this kind of online summit world and, you know, digital courses, et cetera. Um, but she was doing this very early days with, with Deepak and essentially you would create an episodic, um, program. So that could be about yoga or personal development or meditation, et cetera. Uh, it could be 14 days, it could be 10 days, it could be 21 days, but essentially it was episodic in nature. So, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, they had very, um, they advised on, you know, the amount of attention span that people had kind of day to day to ingest content. So they said, okay, make this thing 21 days in our case, um, but could be 14 days. A lot of the, the Deepak um, meditation challenges were 14 days, for example, um, make them, you know, 10 to 20 minutes each episode so people can ingest them, make the registration period free. So you market the program and then you email gate it, but people can take the program for free through entering their email. So really what it is kind of from a business perspective is a very, very robust lead acquisition engine is what they call it, um, where you're offering a tremendous amount of value because you're offering this whole program for free in exchange for someone's email. And then you build this database of people who have registered for the course. So they were very insistent that we launch this course at the top of January, which of course makes sense. We didn't have much time at that juncture because I'd gone to them maybe in like November or something. So we were, we had to hustle, hustle. Um, But they're like, listen, if you want to do this, get it out early January, because that's kind of renew you, et cetera. Right. So it makes sense. And, you know, launch the registration period two to three weeks prior to the program starting. So you have a very, very concentrated period of time to register enough people with their emails. And then, you know, the course begins and it's not way, way, way off in the distance. And so there's kind of an immediacy. Now, I will put the caveat proviso here that we've, since this, this initial masterclass, if you will, uh, we have refined how we do things. And there's lots of different nuances in terms of the creation of online courses and marketing them. But this is the way that they were initially had advised us to do it. Um, so those were many of the components and then, you know, we would create, you know, short form content that would go out on, you know, social media platforms at that juncture, you know, advertising on, you know, Facebook and, you know, using Google for advertising to register emails into an email gated kind of platform. It was incredibly cheap to acquire leads that way. That has significantly changed since that time. Um, but essentially like we spent maybe $6,000 to get 120,000 leads. That would never happen anymore. Have to spend probably $250,000 to get that many leads today. Um, and that would be on a, on with a really good campaign. So we were, we hit it at a good time and you know, what I learned from that experience was that you could build a massive email database, um, in a relatively short period of time. And of course, after the first one that we did, you know, the light bulb went off above my head. It's like, you know, I, I had developed a lot of relationships with, you know, many teachers that had significant audiences, you know, we could essentially build this massive, massive internal email list by doing courses with all of these people, ingesting part of their audiences into a centralized list. And more or less, that is the business model uh, of Commune Open Kimono is that, you know, we've 
put 5 million people through some course at this juncture. All of those people at one point or another had to enter their email. Now, of course, it's a what quote unquote leaky bucket in this world of uh, online courses. So people, you know, leave and unsubscribe and, you know, you're always filling the top of the bucket, so to speak. But, um, but all in all, you know, you can, I think it, it provided that you continue to offer a lot of really, really valuable content, you know, you can build a really, really significant, uh, community that way. And, and, and have like a nice little sustainable business. And that's all I really wanted to do post Wanderlust. Um, candidly, like I had, I was kind of on the, on the growth trajectory addiction with Wanderlust. I was bigger is better all the time. You know, let's do more. And okay, now we need more sponsors to do more. But now those sponsors want us to do more. And it was, you know, just like this, you know, vicious cycle with, with commune. I was like, no, you know, we are going to balance growth with cycles of repair. Uh, we're going to try to mirror the, the, the function and behavior of nature in some way, um, and create a more sustainable business that wasn't based around kind of any sort of hockey stick growth. And, and that's what we've done. You also have attracted some incredible talent to create co-create courses with you, Michael Beckwith, Marianne Williamson, Deepak Chopra, Gabor Mate, Dr. Hyman, Paul Hawken, Jack Cornfield, obviously your, your wife, Skyler. What are some of the best practices for making um, a, 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 the possibility of a course appeal to someone who's got a massive platform of their own? Like, why would they come and do something with you all? Don't bounce your checks. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, candidly, um, you know, I've, again, been very, very fortunate enough to develop a really unique network of relationships with a lot of people. And a lot of that was based around Wanderlust. I mean, I had the good fortune to send out offers to virtually all those people that you just listed and bring them to, you know, some far flung mountainside and put them in front of a couple thousand people in a really, really unique environment. And I think it was very en enriching for those people. And, you know, through executing well around that, I, I built a lot of trust. So that was one side of it. You know, the other piece of it is that, you know, I've really spent significant effort in, in my own life um, to become fluent uh, across a number of topics, you know, that are kind of germane to my both to my physical and psychological health, but are also very helpful when attracting talent. Like I honestly can get on the phone with an integrative or functional medicine doctor and, you know, hold my own on the immune system and metabolic function and, uh, cardiovascular health, et cetera. And through that, um, you know, again, I think you, you garner the trust of people because, you know, you present yourself as someone who is rigorous and really cares about the subject matter. Um, and I do. And so there's not, I'm not, there's no kind of imposter syndrome, although sometimes I feel that way, <laughs> but you know, this is true. And so, you know, you build trust by being authentically interested, um, and grounded in, in the work. Um, I remember the one time I met Wayne Dyer and he really, really bent the arc of my life or my spiritual path. He was, he came to Wanderlust, um, and I came backstage to meet him and I have these like tiny little piano hands, like delicate little hands. And he had these kind of big, like catcher mitt hands. And so like, he kind of enveloped me <laughs> as I like went to shook his hand, he brought me in and, um, and he whispered in my ear, he says, Jeff, stay close to the work, stay close to the work. And I, I really heard that 
And from that time on, I really have stayed close to the work. Um, and, uh, and I think that that, that matters. So you've told that story before. I've heard it before. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering why did he say that to you? Did he, did he observe you not staying close to the work or is that just something he says to everybody or what do you think that was about? You know, it, it's funny. I've heard a lot of stories about him, you know, um, kind of within the Hay House community, for example, they would have these big events and he would never go to the social events or the dinners. You know, he was always like in his hotel room writing and reading. And then obviously he would show up for, you know, his, his talks and what. And, and he, I think he was someone that didn't really put a lot of stake in the limelight, he put much, much more stake in kind of being authentically connected to the work. I'm not, you know, it might've been just like a trope, you know, uh, something that he advised everyone. Um, and, and I, you know, I don't know, but I think, you know, he, or he might've had some intuition with me that at that juncture, here I was certainly talking the talk, uh, but maybe not walking the walk at that juncture. Uh, You've been around a lot of these people over the years. And, um, especially when it comes to course creation, you're, you're either you're there or Jake is there, you know, for hours and hours and hours at, on end <laughs> and yeah. you're having to kind of help people streamline their, um, their knowledge base to make it accessible for people. Who, who have you, who have you all been really impressed with in that regard? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, we, a, a lot of, I mean, we've done 150 courses, 155 or something like that at this juncture. So the experiences are all different and, you know, some teachers come in and it is fully teleprompted. You know, and, and every word is prescribed and the pre-production is all there and they're just reading it down. I mean, it's funny, like we work with Mark Hyman, he, oh, he, he's done it both ways. The first course we, we did with him, he delivered it in basically half a day, um, because it was teleprompted. We did another course with him, which was completely, um, extemporaneous. And obviously he's got some bullet points to kind of keep him on, on track. Um, and they've, they've both been honestly very, very successful. Sometimes people want, sometimes teachers want other people in the room to have that kind of energy or that vibration of being around people. Sometimes other people don't want anyone in the room, you know? Um, and, and so it really depends, you know, on, on different people's comfort levels. Um, and, you know, we just recently shot a, a course with a very, very good friend of mine, an exceptional doctor, uh, a woman named Dr. Casey Means, and she kind of split the difference. You know, she, uh, she had a lot of stuff, very, very organized and slides, et cetera, but she wasn't, um, you, you know, she, she, she didn't have to stick to a prompter, you know, she like, what we find is kind of the best, honestly is when there is a general path, a general guidebook, you know, a series of bullets, but there's such fluency, you know, with the underlying material that the delivery is more extemporaneous. It's honestly just like a piano player. Man. It's like you practice your scales all day long. Eventually you just trust yourself. You go on stage, you forget about the technical well. The technical well is there. And you just trust yourself to summon that. And you try to tap into the spiritual well, if you will. And that's honestly what I try to do as well. So you don't use teleprompters for your courses? Mm -hmm. I actually I thought for mine for my 21 day challenge. I, I loved it. Well, what's interesting about that is I actually wrote it out. It's that was like first draft. I wrote it out like the day before it was due. I just kind of, I don't know. I, I, channeled it or something like that, but it just, I just tried to write it as I was, as I, as I like to speak and I felt like it worked well, but, um, I've done yeah, stuff with off the cuff as well, with just bullet points and that, that has also worked well. 
that has also worked well, but I think yeah, given I think, the choice, I would, I would rather teleprompt it just because it's just, it's just efficient. It, it's very efficient. I think, you know, it, it teleprompting versus non-teleprompting, I, I think is like, what's the medium that you're like, for example, when I'm in a live setting or in a podcast setting, for example, I really want to just trust myself, you know, and, and, um, because I'm not under the microscope to turn every phrase just perfectly. And it's like, when you trust yourself, when you trust yourself as nature, nature will let you down, you know, from time to time, right? Nature is not perfect, but you want to trust it because otherwise, you know, you end up with like the old bogey in the sky with like a cudgel over you, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, uh, if I don't, you know, follow the scripture, then, you know, I'm going to rape my grandmother or something. It's like, no, it's like, we have to trust nature on some level that we have some form of moral intuition or some intuition to be able to summon some sort of guidance such that, you know, we deliver a message with vibrancy and passion and authenticity, et cetera. So more and more, you know, I'm trying to walk into situations and just completely trust myself, um, you know, uh, and, and have faith, you know, faith kind of more as, um, mm -hmm. as sort of eternal reliability, like nature, you know, you, nature has like a reliability to it, you know? It'll let you down, mm -hmm. but it's reliable. So anyhow, that's how I'm trying to go into it. When I look at myself, um, when I've teleprompted things, I, and I've often done it candidly, it feels a little phony to me, but Hey, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, speaking of which, when I do my solo podcast episodes, which are all like an hour 15, I just kind of speak them extemporaneously. And, and those are my, by far my most popular episodes, even though I'll get to the end and I'll think, ah, I don't really like that. And I'll just put it out there anyway. And people love it. So funny because I just listened to the one that you did on abstaining from alcohol mm -hmm. and I loved it. And I was wondering that, uh, that very question, I was like, I, did he write that out or did he just deliver it extemporaneously? Because you don't stutter at all. You know, you're never searching for words. Like when I do things, well, we edit, I, we edit it, out the pauses and the, the double okay, talk and stuff like that too. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough then. Because when I do, um, what I, you know, these, you know, monologues or whatever you want to call them, uh, I, I tend to try to do them that way where, you know, I, I, I have maybe a few notes or just chapter headings in my head, but then I'm, you know, extemporaneously speaking and, uh, and trying to get all the points across, but I find myself, you know, you know, searching for words and, you know, finding turns of phrase or, or uttering turns of phrase that don't always make sense, just like right there, you know, so right. well, well done on that one. But I, I really, really enjoyed it, by the way. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. I kind of feel like I have a tendency to go off and tell stories a little too long and cause it could, but anyway, it's fine. It's all good. Um, so that's, that's really about the course creation, right? From the mm -hmm. perspective of the creator, what have you noticed nowadays about how people take courses? Cause I read the statistic that only about 3% of people who start an online course will finish the course. That's the industry sort of average. Obviously anyone who creates a course wants everyone who takes the course to make it all the way to the end. So they get maximum value out of it. And what are some of the things that you all have implemented even after the Oprah, you know, tutorials that have helped to increase that, that average of people who make it to the end of the course? Hmm. Yeah, we've iterated a lot. I mean, I've seen very, um, intriguing business models where, um, that essentially offer the course for free if you make it to the end. Otherwise, you're charged. <laughs> Wait, and so we, you pay first and then you get yeah, credit back? That's, that's right. right. I've seen I've seen that model, um, which I think is actually fascinating. We've never tried it. I mean, there is a functionality within 
you know, our, our, um, platform, which we use Kajabi where, you know, we can see if someone has taken a session or not. So we, we, you know, obviously can see completion rates, et cetera. So, uh, but we've never tried that particular business model. It might be interesting to do it because then you're really incentivizing someone to finish. Of course they could, they could cheat and they could, da, da, da. but, but we've never tried it. Yeah. I mean, listen, man, it, like the persuasion economy or the attention economy, whatever you're going to call it. I mean, you know, people are uncommonly distracted, you know, time and attention are the most valuable commodities, you know, right now, and everybody's vying for your time and attention. Um, and you know, how you distribute your time and attention is probably one of the most important things that you could think about. Um, and certainly meditation comes into play here in many ways. Um, so in but, anticipation of that people not having a lot of attention, do you shorten the modules now to even more than you did earlier? Yeah. You, in in some cuts to keep people in each. Yeah. I mean, in some cases, but candidly, not really that much, you know, we're, we're not, you know, what we do well is create long form content um that you know is geared around you know delivering a tremendous value for people that are really wanting some form of transformation in their life and candidly if you want that transformation you, gotta, you need to put some time in man and so you know yeah like we're not in some cases if someone's prattling on for two hours we'll say well wait a minute that's that's not going to work but we're not necessarily always designing for like optimal consumption. You know, we're designing to, for, you know, how long does it take to make this point well and, and to be thorough and, and rigorous? And, you know, in some ways, that's a lonely path. Um, of course, you know, it's different on, on social media. You know, we're trying to optimize there to some degree. Um, but yeah, you know, yeah, we are making some of the courses shorter or at the very, very least trying to quote unquote, like sell the courses prior to like a 21 day window elapsing, for example, you know, it's like if you have a 21 day course and you're hoping that someone stays with it the entire time and you're not offering any ability to buy that course until the 21 days are over, that's a tricky business model at this juncture. Um, so, you know, you, let's say you've launched a course and you've got 25,000 people in it, you know, you, you know, you, you're best off trying to sell that course, you know, towards the beginning of that cycle while you still have people's attention. And so, you know, we will do these kind of sales sequences after like the first three or four days or something, just to like give people the opportunity to, to buy in earlier. Um, but you know, the, the other I think change, you know, significant change is that, you know, we were running these for many, uh, years kind of using the, the challenge or the summit model where essentially everyone is going through, um, you know, the course, you know, it's not asynchronous. It's like everyone's going through together at the same time. And there was something, um, very community building about that model. Obviously we're called commune, so we sort of believe in this community. Um, the notion of putting a hundred thousand people through a 14 day program simultaneously, you know, creates a community. It creates a vibration. People are sharing amongst each other. They're posting as they're going through. People are providing accountability. People are helping each other with tips and and, and hacks through the program. And that's wonderful, but it's also very, very limiting because you only have one chance to kind of enter that program. And then if it's passed, it's passed. So now we've changed that model where sometimes we will launch, you know, where everyone is linearly taking the course at the same time, but there's also sort of an evergreen funnel, more or less is what we call it, where you can, you know, maybe you didn't see the course until three weeks later or five months later, you can always enter that course at that juncture and it just gets dripped out and you know, you're not taking it with a hundred thousand people at the same time, but you're still being able to avail yourself of the information. So 
Mm-hmm. You know, that's one way that, that we've iterated some, and that, I think that's fairly common. Yeah, a couple other things I've heard you mention before um, when I came out to the physical space commune is, and, and I, I implemented this, uh, you preview the first couple of modules on your, on your podcast, which mm-hmm. I thought was really cool and innovative to give people a taste of what it's like. And I did that with a couple of my um, online courses. And also... I do this thing where I will uh, offer someone 100% credit back after they complete a particular challenge. So let's say they take a 108-day meditation challenge and it costs $108. I will give them $108 credit hmm. um, at the conclusion of that. And I noticed that my my completion rates jumped up to 80% when I started doing that. Mm. And the credit is used for another challenge in the community. So I keep them in the community. They're now, they've now familiarized themselves with how it works, you know, marking themselves complete every day. I use Mighty Networks. That's my platform. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they end up doing, you know, maybe one or two other challenges, if not more, uh, because they now have the excitement of what it feels like to have. And, and we love that. We love completing yeah. something and then using that credit to basically choose our own adventure. Um, and I got the the name from Vision from Mind Valley, where he he just calls it an accountability fee. So we just call it an accountability fee right now, which I think it's really, yeah. you know, just even though we know it's a payment, just psychologically, just knowing it's an accountability fee, I think it, 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 fits better from, from the user perspective, because it helps them show up even more. Mm, nice. Yeah. I like that idea. Um, you know, sometimes what we do along those lines is if someone has bought a course, we'll go back to them and say, Hey, you can apply, you know, whatever you've already spent, you know, towards a lifetime membership or towards another, um, higher priced item. So they feel mm-hmm. like, um, but I think but the way that you're doing it, I think is very compelling. I think one other thing that we've started to roll in are assessments. And so people can actually track, uh, the value that they're getting from the information. So let's say it's a yoga course for, um, for sake of just conversation here, you know, we might send out an assessment at the beginning, um, that, you know, what is your strength level, your self-reported strength level or your self-reported flexibility level or et cetera, it will, where we'll sort of delineate or, or indicate sort of the, the value points of the course. And at the beginning of that course, they might, you know, say, oh, well, my strength is like a three and my flexibility is like a four. And then, you know, after seven days or 10 days, we'll go back with another assessment Say now that you've taken, you know, 10 days of this yoga course, where would you rate your strength level or your flexibility level? And then they say, okay, well now my strength is a six and my flexibility is like a seven. And then we go back to them and say, like, look, look where you were and look where you are now. And I think that that grounds, I mean, you know, what you measure, you can improve, right? So when people actually witness, uh, those metrics of transformation in their own journey, uh, I think that they, they, they ascribe more value to, to the experience. Is that, is that done through Kajabi or is that uh, a type form that you guys integrate into Kajabi? You can do it in Kajabi. Um, but you can also do it with like a, I think a Google form. Um, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And so, then the, uh, yeah. one more thing about this and then we'll move on to talk about the course you're creating now. Um, we just incorporated a syllabus as well. So I, I literally went mm. through, because I have probably not as many as you I have like a few dozen master classes and challenges, but they're all just sort of individual challenges and you take one and maybe that's the only one you've ever heard about. But I sat down and I said, you know, if I wanted to work on mental health, what are the, what are the challenges and master classes I would recommend someone take in what order? Or if I want to work on my relational health or if I want to work on my physical health and just sat down and created like basically a college curriculum that will last a year where someone can go from one to the next and they get a little bit more guidance in that way. So I become a de facto guidance counselor for their spiritual work, 
which I found yeah. to be very helpful too. That's we've gotten a lot of great response from that as well. Yeah, I mean, I I think that's great, and I think you, you know you are very well equipped for that kind of structure because you are an individual and and obviously of of um, you know of of significant and you provide significant value um, for people over time and people can become very invested in you as their guide as their guide or as their teacher you know obviously for us we're bouncing around between a lot of different topics and a lot of different um, teachers and um, and that has its upsides and honestly it has some of its downside some downsides you know to try to be all things to all people is sometimes very tricky um, but that's the net we've cast, you know, um, we're not like a, you know, I look at like calm or headspace, you know, it's very, very pinpointed platforms that are like, we're going to be your meditation app period, you know, and there's sometimes I'm like jealous of those platforms because they know what they're going to do. You know, that's it. We're doing this like regenerative agriculture and then it's like <laughs> civics and then it's like metabolic health and then it's meditation, then it's yoga. But that's really, it's a kind of more honestly a reflection of the things that I'm interested in. <laughs> so, um, so there, take it or leave it. Um, I bet you that uh, is connective tissue though. You know, like if you go, you yeah. want to be a liberal arts major, you may find yourself taking archaeology and then in the next class you're taking English lit and the next class you're taking Spanish, you know? Yeah, where, where I've um, actually gotten, you know, very interested in, and honestly, Jake is a much more proficient operator of the platform. Uh, I just get to float around and talk to interesting people. But, but what I'm really interested in it, as it pertains to commune now is actually connecting sort of mechanism and science and empiricism with praxis, you know, and being that bridge between the two things. So like, you know, we have like a huge library of functional uh, medicine now. You know, so we have, you know, all of the top teachers, you know, Mark Hyman and Casey Means and Sarah Gottfried and Jeffrey Bland and Austin Perlmutter and David Perlmutter, et cetera. And, you know, many of these, they're, they're addressing different things. They're addressing, you know, neurological health or cardiovascular health or metabolic health. But oftentimes the prescription is many of the same lifestyle prescriptions. It's meditation, it's yoga. It's, you know, healthy diet, it's proper sleep hygiene, et cetera. So, but where we get to really, I think, play a unique role is that we get to say like, okay, now you understand the physiological mechanism through taking this course with this doctor, but you don't have to then go find, you know, some yoga teacher or some meditation teacher out there in the world. You can just go right on the same platform and we've got all the best teachers right there to help you actually instantiate those practices in your life. So, you know, you know, that bridge from learning to practice is, is something that, you know, I'm really excited about building kind of within the platform. Um, and, you know, I, I tried to do that a lot in, in my own courses that I'm starting to develop now. This is interesting. So you're create, you created this, this course called good stress, which I'm now imagining is sort of like one of those Spartan races, you know, like obstacles that you have to kind of overcome. And it's something that I'm actually creating myself. I'm, I'm creating this thing called the year of transformation, which also has activities. But one mm -hmm. thing that I, I'm still trying to solve for, and I'm sure you've also faced this, speaking of course creation is how do you make sure that, because this isn't just like sitting up watching Deepak talk about spirituality. You want people to actually do this stuff. 100%. How do you solve for that? How do you make sure in, within the, the course creation that people are actually going to expose themselves to cold, you know, plunges right. or, or so, do, yes. or do whatever we have going on? Well, I, listen, I, mean, I can't. You have to do it when you, when you have someone standing there, you know, pressuring you to jump in the cold water. But if you're by yourself watching Jeff on, a, on your, in your phone, and he's telling yeah. you to go stand in the shower and just turn the cold water on. Like, what? How do you make sure they do it? <laughs> well, listen, I can't nanny state anybody. Um, <laughs> it's just like you did this unbelievable monologue on on abstaining, on abstinence from drinking. You can't make someone abstain from drinking, right? But what you can do is you can lead the horse to water. In this case, very, very cold water. 
<laughs> um, but uh, but listen, like, a- a- and part of it is just like I-, I feel like I have a certain amount of authenticity and validity to be deal to delivering this information because I lost fifty, sixty pounds. I gained, you know, all of this muscle mass. I reversed my pre diabetes. You know, I-, I really did find ways to transform myself through doing these things. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.